Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Southern New England STEM Goes Red experience. I am Michelle Pope, Chief Operations Officer at CompuClaim, and proud to serve as the chair for this year's STEM Goes Red program. Of course, our first choice would have been to gather in person for our day-long conference. However, we're all faced with having to adjust our daily lives during trying times. As a relentless force, we are committed to continuing the work of the American Heart Association and thrilled to be with you in this virtual setting. I will be your MC for today's event and we have an exciting program for you today. We will hear from incredible speakers that will provide you insight into the possibilities and potential that each of you possess to make a real impact on the world around you. <clears throat> I would like to first take a minute to thank our event sponsors who made this day possible. Without their help, we wouldn't have been able to bring this very important programming to you. Thank you to Amgen, CompuClaim, and Trilex for your generosity and for seeing the value in the STEM Goes Red program. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our first presenter, Juliana Hayes, Rocky Hill Country Day freshman and most importantly, my daughter. Juliana has taken some time to talk with her classmates and gather information that takes a look at young women in STEM fields, and she will share her findings with us today. Welcome, Juliana. All right. If you know you are on the right track, if you have this inner knowledge, then nobody can turn you off, no matter what they say. Barbara McClintock, cytogenesis and winner of the 1983 Nobel Prize in Physiolog Physiology or med and Medicine. <laughs> I wish that more girls followed this today, but sadly they don't, and I'm here to present about that. Hi, I'm Juliana, and I'm presenting on why fewer and fewer girls are joining STEM. This is just a quick overview of what I'll be going over today. Number one, the problem. What is the reason girls aren't pursuing STEM careers and why? Number two, statistics. Some statistics I've gathered to back up my point. Number three, the solution. How can we solve this? And number four, the conclusion. Some of what I've gone over. So the first thing, why aren't girls joining STEM? These are the three main reasons I've found. Sexism, ignorance, and alternative options. This is a graph where employers rated male and female candidates with identical resumes on their competence, hireability, and mentoring. Um, on, all, on all accounts, they rated that men did better than women, making girl, this leads girls to believe that even if they are amazing at technology or engineering, they simply won't make it just because they're a girl. Th this is a graph of, uh, of, some, <laughs> of some polls that I did on, in my class. It showed that 55% of girls actually didn't want to go into STEM careers. It showed that 35% wanted to go into the arts and showed that 15% were undecided. This brings me to the alternative options. Uh, two entries had said they wanted to be painters. Two entries had said they wanted to be fashion designers. Three entries had said they wanted to be interior designers. A and I also did this for the boys. 80% of them wanted to go into STEM careers, 10% wanted to go into sports, and 10% were undecided. And this brings me to the ignorance. Nobody really had a specific reason why they wanted to do it. It, it was mostly because they, their parents did it, or just because it seemed cool, or they thought they were decent at it. There, we need to make sure that we are educating people about the careers to go into. This brings me to the goals. Number one, we need to get girls more interested. Number two, we need to show them the opportunities that STEM careers open. And number three, consider changing the STEAM. So how to get girls more interested? We do this through programs and projects. Schools need to have more programs that encourage STEM curriculum and that make it more fun. And projects, classes need to have more hands-on projects so that girls and guys will be more excited about the subject. as well as opportunities. So as I said earlier, STEM careers open up so many opportunities, but most people don't know that. Most people think that the math part in STEM just means math, like being a teacher. They don't think about how it could mean building a rocket ship or like solving cancer, stuff like that. But so we need to teach them. 
And number, and number three, consider changing to STEAM. STEAM represents STEM plus the arts. Humanities, language arts, dance, drama, music, visual arts, design, and new media. The main difference between STEM and STEAM is STEM explicitly focuses on scientific concepts. It is shown through studies that STEAM causes a larger variety of girls to join. STEAM helps teach girls how to be more creative as well as critical thinkers. Less and less girls are joining STEM. Let's fix that. Thank you. Juliana, thank you so much for sharing your time today. And obviously you've put a lot of work into, um, into this event. So uh, on behalf of the American Heart Association, thank you for, for your time. We do have some questions coming in. Um, and if it's okay, I'm gonna read them to you and, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about um, unpacking this amazing presentation. Um, first, um, what was the biggest challenge um, that you faced when doing this research? Well, I would say it was mostly, I was coming, it was coming up with the, the three same points and it was trying to find backup research to go with that, which is why I ended up doing the uh, polls throughout my class. Cause it was coming up to the three main reasons like sexism, like not many people knowing what it actually means and stuff like that. But it wasn't giving like many backup points to show the information behind it. That's great. Um... And let's see, what inspired you to do this research um, on STEM careers? I know um, possibly, you know, your mother's involvement with, with the event, but um, again, what, what inspired you to say, you know what, I wanna, I wanna understand this a little more and I wanna take the time out of my day to, to really um, bring this, to, bring this to, um, to, to all of us watching and to all of us that'll be watching this recorded. That's a good question. Um, well, yeah, when my mom did bring it up to me, I honestly just thought it would be interesting because I, I did know there was a problem and that not many of the girls or like the friends I have were planning on going into those careers. So it was just kind of interesting to see like what was behind it. It is very interesting, isn't it? It's, it's something that initially it isn't something that we think about, but it is obviously very important. And, you know, as the American Heart Association, um, looks to fund research and, and the importance on um, funding that research as it relates to women. Um, we really wanna be able to fund more women. So this, this at a younger age to be able to follow a STEM career and, and move forward into, um, you know, in, into a STEM career in college and, and furthermore really to, to take that career path is really important. So um, let's see, we have, we have some more questions. Um, thanks for your amazing, thanks for your presentation, Juliana and that amazing research you did. What was the most surprising thing that you found through your research? Huh. Um, I was actually, so this wasn't stuff that this, through the polls I found, um, I was actually pretty surprised because a good amount of the girls from my school did want to go into like from the, because I researched throughout my whole middle school, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And a good like the sixth and seventh graders, they actually did want to go into STEM careers. If you saw on the graph, 55% did which I thought was interesting and, I, and it surprised me. They must have um, some good science, t science and math teachers uh, at your school who are really inspiring the students to- One of them's to... gonna be talking later. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're very excited to have, to have one of your teachers from last year as a panelist later. So, um, so here's another one. I'm currently in the seventh grade and I was wondering what ways you would suggest for me to learn more about STEM and see if Something, and to see if it's something that I'm interested in while I'm in middle school. Is there anything that you've done in terms of clubs or organizations or you, that you came across with your research? De well, I would say definitely reach out, see what programs and stuff that your school is doing now. Reach out to your teachers, talk to them about trying to do individual projects and things like that. I'm not sure if they still do these types of things, but like science fairs, all, those are always fun. That is and then fun. once you do get to middle school, there there's gonna I mean high school, there's gonna be a bunch of different clubs and like things that you'll have much more of an outreach. That's great. Um, I don't know um, if anyone else has any additional questions to ask. Um, I will just ask just for myself, um, Juliana. Um, not, not as much asked, but just say thank you again so much for being a part of this and giving of your time to do all of this great research and um, really highlight 
to, to the young, um, well, at this point, I know that you're in high school now, but to the middle school and high school students who are watching who um, you know, can be inspired by you. So thank you so much, Juliana. Yeah. Have a wonderful day. You too. All right. Thank you, Juliana. That was an amazing presentation. I'm so very proud of you. And it was extremely informative and insightful and generated a lot of great questions. So great job filling those, those questions as well. We appreciate all the hard work and creativity that you put into putting together such a great presentation. So thank you again. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Kim Arkand. Kim is a visualization scientist for NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. I cannot wait for you all to be inspired by her amazing work. Welcome, Dr. Kim Arcand. Anyways, I hope everyone's having a good morning so far. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, heart disease is definitely near and dear to my heart. My family has quite a bit of it, and I even have a bit of a, a heart issue myself. So being able to pay attention to issues surrounding the heart is, as I mentioned, just really important to me. And I'm very, very pleased to be here with you all today. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about what I get to do for a living, um, which I, I think is rather fun and talk a little bit about STEM careers more broadly and how different types of topics in STEM can actually be combined into one career. So on my next slide, um, you'll see that I am not an astronaut. <laughs> I've worked for a NASA mission for like 22 years, um, but I have been pretty much with my feet firmly planted on the ground for that whole time. Though I do get to work with astronauts. Um, next slide. I actually started out in microbiology, so I was very interested in um, medicine, actually, I was on a pre-med track. I was studying to be a doctor and I had actually wanted to be a cardiologist. Um, but as I was finishing up my undergraduate degree at the University of Rhode Island, I realized that I did not want to spend my time doing that. And instead I, I found that I was very attracted to computer science. So for me, computer science was a sort of connective tissue, if you will. Um, between my undergraduate work in biology and then what I would end up doing in astronomy. Next slide. So I actually got the job that I have by doing a fellowship at the University of Rhode Island in parasitology. And I was studying uh, Lyme disease and the ticks that can give it to humans. And having that job, which next slide, combined with the computer science uh, fields. I was usually like using data to be able to figure out how to um, visualize this, this topic. Um, brought me to, next slide, working for NASA's Chandrax Observatory. So the Chandrax Observatory is one of NASA's major missions. It's like a sister telescope to the Hubble Space Telescope. I don't know if you've heard of the Hubble Space Telescope. And it has been a true um, just a huge presence in astrophysics and the amount of discoveries and science that Chandra has been able to contribute to has been just mind boggling. Next slide. So Chandra was launched back in 1999 and Chandra is a very large telescope. It's about the size of a school bus and it was actually the largest payload to ever put on the space shuttle. So it was a pretty dangerous mission. Next slide. But these are the two astronauts that I worked with primarily on the mission. There are um, a few others as well, but on the left of the screen is um, Colonel Eileen Collins. And she was actually the first woman to command a NASA space shuttle mission when she commanded this mission that deployed Chandra. And on the right of the screen is Katie Coleman. And she is an astronaut and a chemist. And she was actually responsible for deploying Chandra out into space. So uh, these two women have been mentors for me for pretty much my whole adult life, um, whether they know that or not, and have just been a, a true pleasure to watch as their careers have also grown and flourished. Next slide. So Chandra gets to look at some pretty high energy things, so things that create lots of heat in the universe, like exploding stars, areas around black holes, and colliding galaxies, among many, many other topics. Um, it's the type of job where 
you get something new to look at every day. Next slide. I'm gonna go very, very quickly through the next few slides. So I'm not gonna say next slide, I'm just gonna hope they're paced about like one a second or so. So over these next few slides, we're looking at images of baby stars and stellar nurseries, which are where, just as it sounds, stars are born. We're looking at old stars, stars that are about to explode, mature stars, stars like our sun that have outlasted their fusion. Stars that are much more massive than the sun that have exploded in incredibly powerful um, supernova explosions. Areas around black holes, galaxies of all shapes and sizes from pinwheels and exclamation marks to whirlpools and jets galore. So we're looking at some of the largest gravitationally bound objects in the universe, clusters of galaxies, and some of which actually look like they're smiling back at us. So. Um, but the type of thing that I'd like to talk about as well is that there are actually many different kinds of light in the universe. And here we're actually looking at an image of our sun, but we're looking at some of the different kinds of light that our sun can emit. So we're probably used to so perhaps the usual sunlight that we're, we're seeing today, right? That's visible light or optical light. And we're probably also familiar with the warmth that we feel from the sun, which is infrared light. And you're probably also familiar with, for example, um, microwave light. For example, if you've ever heated up macaroni and cheese in your microwave, or you're perhaps uh, familiar with radio light, if you've ever um, talked to devices across a long distance. On our next slide, we'll see that all of these different kinds of light make up the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And having access to all of these different kinds of light is really important for astronomy specifically, but also all different kinds of sciences, whether you're in a medical field or whether you're in some sort of um, microbiology field or in some sort of chemistry or whatnot. On our next slide, we'll just see that this is the Chandrax Observatory. Again, on the upper left, it goes about a third of the way to the moon. Chandra has to go way up above our atmosphere because Earth's atmosphere has a number of superpowers, and one of those superpowers is the fact that it protects us from x-rays from the universe, which is really important because life would certainly not have evolved as it had if we were being bombarded by high energy x-rays all the time, right? So there is an object in the universe that we just saw those, those photons, those little packets of energy or light that have been traveling for thousands upon thousands of years, if not millions or even billions of years. And that light is then recorded on the spacecraft's instruments and then packaged up in the form of ones and zeros, which is binary code, and then sent down to Earth via NASA's Deep Space Network. Eventually it goes from NASA's Deep Space Network to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California before eventually it makes its way to any number of laptops, including my own here in New England. On the next slide, you'll see that when it comes down to it, all of these images of the universe, they're not space selfies. They, they truly are just a system of ones and zeros, right? That's how we talk to computers. That's how we talk to phones. And so part of my job is to take those ones and zeros in their simplest form and then translate them into something that is a visual representation of the object in the universe. So on our next slide, we'll see that we can look at different kinds of objects like this object here, which is an exploded star. So the remains of the star may be 10, 15 times the size of our sun, that eventually the star started to run out of its fuel, its core collapsed, and then it exploded its guts out all over the universe. And we're looking at this now in optical light from the Hubble Space Telescope. But on the next slide, we'll see that this is the same patch of sky in X-ray light. So it's a completely different picture of our universe. And the next slide, Kim, I, I, I hate to interrupt here, but I have a oh. question that I think is really pertinent to what we're looking at right now. Absolutely. I love questions and I can't see the chat while I'm talking. So this is perfect. Great. So I'm going to interrupt <laughs> you with you when I see them. So um, we have a question. How long does it take to create these beautiful images? Well, uh, yeah, that's a great question. And it actually really depends on how complex the data set is. So this image has about a million, a million and a half worth of seconds of information. And what we did here is we actually took the fingerprints of the information. So when you're looking at all of this light from an object like an exploded star, for example, um, it's kind of like looking at 
at um, barcodes, right? Like at the grocery store, there are all these barcodes on all the products that you're interested in. And each of those little barcodes of the light tells us what kinds of light is being emitted. So did that light originate from like silicon? Did it originate from iron? Did it originate from calcium or what have you? So what we did in this particular instance is we sort of like decoded all of the different kinds of light and all those chemical elements that's, that are being emitted in that remnant. So we're essentially visualizing um, the iron, which is in like the purple, um, the silicon, which I believe was in the green, the neon, the calcium, the argon, et cetera. Um, so doing that takes a little longer. And then we layered the x-ray data with the optical data as well. So this probably took at least two weeks, I'd say, to do. Um, but you know, sometimes you can get an image much faster if it's just a really short observation and a very simple, like one color applied across the data that might only take you, I don't know, perhaps an hour. So it really depends. And it, actually, as we're stepping through the next couple of slides, I'll show you the other things that we do with the data that can make it much longer of a process. Does that answer the question? I think it did. Yeah, that's great. Wonderful. Thank you. And, and I, as I see them come in that pertain to what we're talking about, sure. I'll interject. Otherwise, we can take them at the end too. Wonderful. I love questions. Um, okay, so on the next slide, you'll see that again, I just started talking about this idea that color is actually applied. When we're looking at data that is x-ray data, that data is invisible to human eyes, right? So this is there's no way to just be like click done, right? It, it's something that has to be translated because we can't see it with human eyes any other way. So we take that data, we process it into an image, then we have a black and white image, we process it some more. On the next slide, you'll see a slightly more raw version that comes down from the telescope after just running it through like one bit of software. Um, and then again, on the next slide, you'll see that we can go well beyond a two-dimensional image once we have really good data and actually learn how to figure out what of the information of that, that exploded star is moving away from us and which of that information is moving towards us. And in doing so, when you have that really great data, you can make a 3D model. Um, so this 3D model that is on the screen now is actually showing the location of the iron, the silicon, the sulfur in that three dimensional space so that we can actually recreate that star, how it exploded. And what's interesting is when you're able to do that, you know, we can't look inside a star when we're just looking at, for example, the sun, we're not looking inside it, we're just looking at the sort of outer bits and pieces. But when you have a star that's exploded, it's kind of like, you know, CSI, you're able to reverse engineer how the star lived by looking at how it died and what happens in that aftermath. Um, so it's a bit of detective work to be able to figure out what stars were like before they exploded. But being able to see them after they exploded is actually really, really important for understanding how they lived. Uh, and so on the next slide, you'll see that again, when you have that same data and you can 3D print it. So when you're 3D printing a star that exploded, which by the way, this, this model looks a little strange. It's because at the time we did this, which was back in like 2010, um, we didn't have our own 3D software. So we actually had to borrow some medical imaging software from a local Boston area hospital um, that was used to essentially uh, slice images of brains uh, to make the 3D images of like a brain scan. So that's why this 3D model looks a little bit unique. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that one of the things we've also been able to do, this is one of my students at Brown University, she is going to be walking inside this star that exploded. So we're using virtual reality, augmented reality, and other kinds of extended reality, um, including holograms to be able to understand these stars and then to be able to teach other people about them. So she's actually walking inside that, that dead star, um, though the camera person's on the outside. Uh, and the scale of this thing is pretty intense, by the way. It's about 40 million billion times the surface area of our sun and planets. And you can toss in Pluto if you like. Um, it is a very massive object when compared with the size of us and compared with the size of our solar system. But really, when all things are considered, it's, it's a very tiny object in the universe. On the next slide, um, we'll see that we've been able to take this into augmented reality, so using different kinds of headsets and devices, we can actually build this exploded star from scratch by element. And you'll see uh, my demoer over here is going to be clicking on different layers of the star so that you can build up the exploded star by iron, by silicon, by calcium, and take each layer away so that you can sort of understand 
how the star's uh, life ended. And really when the star's life ended, it's just kind of yet another beginning. So on the next slide, one of our more recent um, versions. Hopefully everyone could hear that, but essentially that was just taking that same data uh, that we were working with before. And instead of turning it just into a visual, we translated it into sound. What's really interesting about translating scientific data into sound is that human sense of hearing is actually pretty well equipped to be able to pick out information from a lot of noise. Um, so think about, for example, if you're ever at a, a small party before pandemic times, and there is a lot of talk going on in the room, but you are sitting next to someone and you are able to hear that person pretty well. And you could also probably pick up on a conversation going on beside you, right? And you could even sometimes, if someone's loud enough, talk, hear about something that's going on on the other side of the room, even though there's this hum of noise in there. Um, so that human sense of hearing is usually good to pick out information. And when you have information that you're able to translate into sound, it's just another tool in the tool belt to be able to understand something that's happening. And it's particularly useful for people who are either blind or visually impaired or low vision because it's a way for them to be able to access data that is beyond the visual. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, most of this information, all of the information coming from Chandra, which is x-rays, and then most of the information even coming from telescopes like Hubble are actually types of data or um, light that we really can't see, whether it's beyond human vision completely, or even if it's in the optical area, uh, it's so far away that the human eye is not strong enough to detect it, right? So we have to be able to translate that into different methods. And on the next slide, you'll just see that when it all is said and done, it's all just data, right? And it's a way to process our data and to make something new with it. And by doing so, we're taking that information and we're following the science story. We're not making things up, um, but we are people and we are choosing to make certain uh, steps or do certain steps that you know affect how the image looks or how the 3D model is 3D printed or how the piece sounds, for example, um, because we are, again, humans using telescopes that humans built and then translating that information that's captured with software that humans wrote. And then again, doing that final process of translation ourselves. Um, so we pay attention to the story, but I think there's no science that is ever 100% subjective. There's always a bit of the human in everything we do. And that's, that's not a bad thing. And then I think the next slide is just um, a little brief discussion. I won't go into it too much because I think I've been talking a long time. Um, but one of the things that I like about my job is that I get to do a lot of different things. So I get to use computer science. I get to use English language arts and talk about um, different kinds of science topics in the form of books. Um, and on the next slide, um, just a few references here at the bottom, all of the work that I do, all of these URLs, they're all, um, open access so that if you're interested in any of the 3D models, the virtual reality, or if you want to learn how to code, all of those little bits and pieces that I talked about, you can find those URLs at the bottom. So please feel free to take a quick snapshot of this slide. And I would love to go to questions at this point, because hopefully there's a lot of them. And I truly have to say answering questions is like my favorite thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and read them. We do have some questions and we also have some pre-submitted questions Great. Um, from some folks that weren't able to um, attend in person, but are going to be receiving the recording. So um, yeah, so let me just get started. Um, during your time at NASA, how often does the technology you use um, at work change? Which I oh. think, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great question. Um, like every day is, can I say that as an answer? I mean, it, it truly is amazing to me that when I first started this job about 22 years ago, I could never have imagined that fast forward, you know, two decades and I would be using virtual reality to look at this data or that I'd be translating it into a hologram, right? Like when I was growing up, holograms were just on Star Trek and Star Wars, right? But um, now we have the technology and we do that actively, um, not as just an afterthought, but incorporating it into our work. 
And that has been really, really exciting, right? To go from just getting a simple image back in 1999 uh, with a, a, an hour's worth of data to being able to take, you know, millions of seconds worth of data and compile it into some new form where you're essentially walking inside it or using haptic technology, which is like um, the vibration technology that's used on your phones to give you messages, for example, if you've got it muted. Um, using haptic technology so that you can feel uh, the supernova remnant as you're walking through a virtual reality piece, right? There are so many ways that technology has changed. But I will say one of the things that remains constant is that the basic programming languages that I learned back in the gosh, mid 90s, I guess, late 90s and early 2000s have all done me very well. So if you're at all interested in a job at NASA, one of the things I would say is that one very good tract is to learn how to code because if you learn like a scripting language today, some popular choices like JavaScript are still um, very popular and were popular back when I was learning languages. Um, also even things like Python, fantastic, or even Perl is still being used. Um, and then if you wanna go a little further into object oriented languages like uh, C Sharp, C++ or Java, um, I learned C++ when I was young, but I now use C Sharp to do coding in Unity to make virtual reality. So it all sort of comes about full circle. Yeah. Wow, that's 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 amazing. And I, I like. Um, we'll we'll go ahead and try to capture these um, these URLs as well, and and send them. Make sure that everyone gets them in the chat box as well, because I think we have a, a lot of you know young women who would like to visit those for sure. Great, yeah. Um, all right, let's see. Um, I already asked that one. Um, how did you pick your career path? Um, mm. How did you know that this is what you wanted to do? Yeah, you know, I mean, when I was a kid, I definitely did not say, when I grow up, I'm going to be a visualization scientist, right? Like, I don't, I didn't know that that was even a thing. Um, but what I did know when I was young would be two things. One is that I just loved science. I loved science. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a veterinarian. I wanted to be an environmentalist. I wanted to be an astronaut, although, you know, very weak stomach here who like, I can't even handle like the tilt a whirl. So that, you know, clearly was off the table for me. Um, but I just love the idea of all of these puzzles that were out there that needed to be figured out. And that's, that's kind of what my job is in a way, right? Um, and then another thing I think was always important to me was communicating with people. Um, I just, from a very, very young age, I was very shy, like really shy, I like hide behind my mom's legs kind of shy. And um, I remember when I first went to kindergarten, I hadn't made any friends. I was just a little like, just really shy. And my very first friend was this little girl. She was deaf and she had been learning sign language. And she had like a, an assistant with her that was teaching her sign language or teaching her more sign language. And they made friends with me and they started teaching me sign language. And I remember just being so amazed, even though I was really young at thinking like, you know, this is so cool that I can learn another way to communicate with someone. And that lesson stood with me for the rest of my life because I mean, as you probably heard from some of the previous things I talked about, I don't like to just look at the universe. I like to consider what else we can do with our data and what other senses can we incorporate because I really do want to make sure the universe is accessible for everyone because truly when you improve on how you communicate for someone you're actually improving how you communicate for everyone right and that's something that I've just been passionate about pretty much my whole life so I hope that answers your question. I think that does. Um, so just to kind of go back to the coding that we that you said was really kind of crucial for many career. What how would you prepare for a career in coding or what courses should they what, what should they be thinking about, you know, as middle school, early high school students? Around coding? So very, very good question. So um, I would say, you know, first start where your interests are. I think the really cool thing about coding specifically is I don't know, it might sound really dry and boring, but I promise it's not. Um, it is like, for me, coding was like a key that literally helped me unlock bits of the universe, right? 
Um, but coding can help you do so many things. Like we use coding to make the sounds that you heard earlier. So coding can actually help you make music, in this case, music of the, the universe, but lots of other things. I know artists that use coding to make art. Um, I know people who use coding to figure out language, like how Shakespeare applied certain words, for example, in his plays across like the comedies or the dramas and the histories. Um, so coding has such wide applicability and it's well, well beyond just, you know, me kind of whacking through some data to make a, an image of the universe. There's just such a need for it everywhere too. Um, but I would say start start small if you're not really sure. I mean, I didn't have anyone to teach me coding when I was a kid. I didn't even like think I had a computer by the time I was in junior high school, but it was like, I mean, I'm in my mid forties. So my computer was <laughs> not super useful. By the time I got to college, I just taught myself HTML. And HTML is one of those languages I think that's undersold as a first step at least because with HTML, you can make stuff. You can make something really beautiful um, and you can communicate and storytell whether it's about yourself or whether it's about a topic that you like. So I always encourage people to just not overlook simple things like HTML. For me, once I started HTML, then I'm like, well, if I wanna make something I did a little bit more special on my pages, I need to learn JavaScript. And JavaScript too is another language. It's just easy to secure into. I was doing mostly just learning it myself. Um, I didn't take a formal class until I think my senior year, no, junior year of college. Um, and I just audited it because I had a full schedule. Um, but over the summers, I would just kind of sit down with some coding books and kind of, you know, pitter my way through them. And then I did take a couple like online MOOCs, I guess they're called online courses. Um, today, you could probably learn a whole lot just through looking at YouTube videos of coding. Um, and there are lots of ways to do like girls who code and black girls code and hour of code. There's there's a lot of different uh, platforms, I guess you would say, to be able to, to learn bits of coding here and there. So I guess I would just say that's a long answer, um, but at the heart of it, it's just start somewhere you're comfortable. If you like history, there are places that you can learn how to code using history as your kind of like wrapper. And if you're into art, I mean, the sky's the limit of the types of things that you could do. So like pick a topic as your inspiration and then figure out what you would like to do, what you think would be fun. That's a great, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, I have two more questions before we let you get back to the amazing work that you do. Um, so wow, Kim, I can't believe how many different areas you work in. What is the favorite, what is your favorite part of your job? Oh, I can't pick a favorite. That's like, you know, picking my favorite child and my two teenagers are right next to me. So I can't say that. Um, and, you know, and parent never can. Um, for me, I would say that there's just like, what the favorite part of my job is, is the ability to do any of those things, right? So um, I, I am a person with a short attention span who tends to get bored a little easily. So for me, it was really important to be able to build a job that let me play. And I use play in kind of like a broader sense, but like sometimes I'm just trying to figure out a problem and I don't always know what the solution is gonna be, but I think that if I experiment here or there, I might get something with it later, but there's no guarantee. Um, and I think science is one of those areas and so is art where you have perhaps a little more ability to do that kind of play um, than you might otherwise, it's not all cases, but just um, what I found is that if you look for a job where you are allowed to sort of question and then follow your curiosity down unprescribed paths that might have absolutely no value at the end whatsoever, um, I find that very satisfying. I've fortunately been able to make it worth our while, so to speak, each time. Um, we now have a full virtual reality program that I would never have expected. Um, we've turned our 3D printing into this entire program that we use with students who are blind or low vision. Um, and now the data on vacation is just another way too of being able to understand the universe. So I think what I like about my job best is the fact that I can just play in all of those fields. I find that very satisfying. That's great. Um, one more question um, came in before I have my last final question are, yeah. are all black holes the same? 
Oh, no, that's a great question. So <laughs> no, they're definitely very different. So um, it's kind of like, you know, like the three bears, right? There's all these different sizes. There's um, small, medium and large black holes. And in, it's really very much under discussion how some of the most massive um, black holes in our universe even originated. Um, the way we understand black holes now is that essentially when a star explodes, a star like our sun, by the way, I should just give a quick disclaimer because I've had parents get upset at me if people get scared, but our sun um, will never go supernova. In about 5 billion, BBB billion um, years or so, our star will expand into a red giant, puff off its outer layers and then shrink down a bit. So in you know many, many billions of years, we'll have to find a new home. Um, but stars that are more massive can explode in the supernova remnant like we've seen here, or stars that are more massive yet um, can explode and completely obliterate themselves and then what's left over kind of collapse to form a black hole. There's also other pathways as well, kind of in between those scenarios where you have a, a supernova, but then afterwards there's like magic, like massive gravitational collapse that then causes a black hole to be formed. Um, and those form what are called stellar uh, mass black holes. But there are black holes that are much much larger, like the ones that are in the centers of galaxies. Um, and it's possible that those have formed over such long periods of time that they've grown and grown and grown because black holes can, just like galaxies, can collide, can combine. Um, and as you feed a black hole, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but still, we're not entirely sure how some of the largest, the most supermassive black holes even formed. So. Um, there are so many questions in astronomy that have to be answered. I think that's one of the reasons I like this job. You're never bored. You are never bored. There's no way to be bored. That's great. Um, we have a couple follow-up questions that if it's okay, I might share that with you sure. um, after the event and, and we'll make sure to get those back out to those of you asking because I feel like we could we could talk to you and ask you questions. Um, I love the, questions, so please the do send them out. Hour. So <laughs> the, those that are still putting in um, questions, know that I will get those to Kim and get them back to you. Um, and I feel like you've already done this, Kim, but if, is there any little bit of wisdom that you would like to leave um, those watching you with? And, and I, I feel like the whole time that you've been giving us wisdom, but is there any little information that you'd like to share uh, um, as a conclusion? Well, I, you know, I don't know that I, I have any wisdom to give really, but just I I hope if you do have questions that you, you feel free to ask them. I think I, I didn't know when I was growing up the huge array of possibilities out there. And I didn't have... Um, a lot of, you know, I have a lot of examples of other women that were doing some of these things. And it's just one of my like absolute greatest pleasures to be able to talk to girls and young women as they're making their career choices. Because if I can be of any help or any of assistance um, as you're making those determinations, I, I, it just, that kind of thing makes my day. So I guess for my last little bit, I would just say, you know, the universe is yours to discover. There are so many things out there to do. There are so many issues that need solving. There are so many questions to be answered and whether you're answering them through a science lens or through an art lens or through any other lens out there. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of work to be done. So the universe is yours. I hope you do something really cool. Kim, thank you so much for sharing your beautiful work with us. So, so very inspiring. inspiring. I've, I'm going to date myself here, Kim, and, and I took coding in college as well, but I, I coded in RPG and COBOL. So awesome. <laughs> I'm not even sure if those languages are, are still around. But Oddly enough, um, yes. So Chandra actually uses a little COBOL because Chandra was built in the late 80s and early 90s. So yeah, you're, you'd be very relevant at Chandra. Oh, thank you. If I do decide to uh, switch careers again, I'll let you know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank you again, Kim.